Chapter 27. Work at last. I could never have imagined the scene now unfolding in front of me. It was neither a blood transfusion clinic nor a regular institute for the treatment of organic health. It was a series of vast wards connected with one another and crowded with truly emaciated beings. Strange complaining filled the air. Groans, sobs, and phrases of pain were uttered at random. Ghastly faces, bony hands, monstrous looks bore witness to terrible spiritual misery. My first impressions were so heartbreaking that I had to resort to the resources of prayer so I wouldn't faint. Tobias was undisturbed and called the older nurse who answered attentively. There are so few assistants, he wondered, what happened? Minister Flaccus, explained the elderly woman in a respectful tone, decided that the majority of them should accompany the Samaritans on their duties today in the regions of the Umbral. Then we must double our efforts, he said serenely. We have no time to lose. Brother Tobias, brother Tobias, have mercy, cried out an old man gesturing and clutching the bed like a lunatic. I'm suffocating. This is a thousand times worse than death. Help! Help! I have to get out. To get out. I need air. A lot of air. Tobias examined him carefully and asked, Why is Ribeiro so much worse? He had one of his worst crises, explained the nurse. And Assistant Goncalves explained that the heavy waves of dark thoughts emitted by his incarnate family members were the main cause of his deteriorating condition. Since he's still very weak and hasn't accumulated enough mental strength to break free of his strongest ties to the world, the poor man hasn't been able to resist as well as we would have liked him to. While the benevolent Tobias patted the patient's head, the nurse continued, Early this morning, he took off without our permission, running around in every direction. He was yelling that he was needed at home, that he couldn't forget his wife and weeping children, that it was cruel to keep him here so far from home. Lorenzo and Hermes tried as hard as they could to get him back into bed, but it was impossible. Then I decided to apply some prostrating magnetic passes on him, which took away his strength and mobility for his own good. You did the right thing, Tobias said thoughtfully. I'll see to it that measures are taken to counteract his family's attitude. They need to receive a bigger bag of worries so that they'll leave Ribeiro alone. I looked at the patient trying to determine his emotional state and I identified the expression of a truly mentally deranged person. He had called to Tobias like a child who knows his benefactor, but he seemed utterly unaware of what was being said about him. Noticing that I was puzzled, my new instructor explained, The poor man is still in a nightmarish phase, during which the soul sees and hears nothing but its own afflictions. In their real life, here, my friend, people reap exactly what they have sown for themselves. Our Ribeiro allowed himself to fall prey to many illusions. I wanted to ask about the cause of his suffering and the history of his situation, but I remembered the judicious advice of Lysias's mother regarding my curiosity, so I kept still. Tobias talked to the patient with kind words of optimism and hope. He promised that he would see to the means of improving his situation, that for his own benefit he should remain calm, and that he shouldn't be upset at being confined to his bed. Trembling all over and with a ghastly face, Ribeiro smiled sadly and thanked him in tears. We walked between numerous rows of well-kept beds, sensing the unpleasant emanations of the place which, as I later learned, came from the patient's mental vibrations. They were still under the painful impressions of physical death, or in many cases, under the control of inferior thoughts. These wards are reserved only for male spirits, my companion kindly explained. Tobias, Tobias, I'm thirsty and starving to death, yelled a patient. Help me, brother, shouted another. For the love of God, I can't stand it any longer, cried out a third. My heart was heavy in the face of the suffering of so many creatures and I couldn't help but ask, 
My friend, this lot of so many suffering and tortured spirits is so very sad. Why this anguishing picture? Tobias replied without hesitation. We mustn't see only pain and desolation here. Remember, my brother, that these patients are being taken care of, that they have just been taken from the umbral, where so many traps lie in wait for those who are not prepared, who are not careful of themselves. The patients in these wards are at least being prepared for the work of regeneration. As for their tears, we must remember that their suffering is of their own doing. People's lives will always be centered on where they have set their hearts. And after a pause during which he seemed deaf to all the clamoring, he added, These are smugglers in the life of eternity. What do you mean? He smiled and answered firmly. They believed that earthly assets would have the same value on the planes of the spirit. They believed that criminal pleasure, the power of money, rebellion against the law, and the imposition of their whims on others would cross the boundary of the grave and still be the case here, offering them new opportunities for further evil doings. They were thoughtless businessmen. They forgot to exchange their material acquisitions for spiritual credit. They didn't learn the simplest currency exchange operation in the world. When they traveled to London, for instance, they never forgot to exchange their Brazilian contos de ris for pounds sterling. However, the mathematical certainty of physical death didn't stimulate them to accumulate spiritual value. Now look at them, millionaires of the physical plane transformed into beggars of the soul. Tobias was absolutely right. He couldn't have been more logical. After he had distributed comfort and a lot of instruction to the patients, my new teacher led me to what looked like a large infirmary next door. He remarked, Let's take a look at some of the unfortunate half-dead. Narcissa, the nurse, accompanied us diligently. She let us in, and I nearly staggered before the anguishing surprise. Thirty-two men with sinister faces were lying motionless on very low beds and displaying only light, breathing movements. Tobias nodded towards them and explained, The suffering spirits are in a much heavier sleep than that of our other ignorant brothers. We call them negative believers. Instead of accepting the Lord, they were intransient vassals of selfishness. Instead of believing in life, action, and labor, they believed only in nothingness, idleness, and the victory of crime. They turned their human experience into a constant preparation for a big sleep. And since they had no notion of morality or of serving the common good, there is nothing left for them now except to sleep on for many years filled with sinister nightmares. I couldn't express my awe. I looked on in amazement as Tobias very caringly began to apply strengthening magnetic passes over the patients. When he had finished treating the first two, they both began spewing a black substance from their mouths, a sort of dark and viscous vomit, like some kind of terrible cadaverous emanation. They are expelling poisonous fluids, explained Tobias very calmly. Narcissa was doing her best to keep up with the cleaning, but was unsuccessful. A large number of them had begun expelling the same dark and fetid matter. It was then that I instinctively grabbed some cleaning implements and ardently got to work. The nurse seemed happy with the humble help of her new brother, while Tobias looked at me with satisfaction and gratitude. The work continued throughout the day and brought with it a blessed sweat. None of his friends back on earth could possibly have appreciated the sublime joy of the doctor who had re-begun his self-education by working in basic nursing.